Good morning, everyone. Uh, really good to be with you uh, this morning and uh, welcome to everyone joining us from uh, around the world. Uh, yes, Mr. Says, my name is Ivan. I'm an assistant professor at uh, the University in Aviation Management. Um, I have been at Coventry for uh, about five years and um, in that time I've served as the course director of our postgraduate MSc in our transport management and for a time I was the acting course director of our undergraduate programme uh, as well. And um, my career previously um, was in education and consultancy and training, um, but I spent a couple of years working for uh, TUI. Uh, for those of you that are from maybe some parts of the world, you might not recognise that brand. Um, TUI is the world's largest uh, leisure travel company. Uh, I also spent a little bit of time working at um, EasyJet and, uh, and British Airways brands that might be a little bit more recognisable to some of you. My particular interest in terms of aviation um, is really in, in the issues pertaining to sustainability and in terms of sustainable travel, uh, sustainable tourism and in service operations management. Um, I teach across a range of modules on the undergraduate and postgraduate programme in relation to marketing and operations and I also teach uh, a bit of project management um, as well. But really this morning I want to talk a bit about the context and challenges that are facing uh, the aviation and air transport industry and in, in the current global uh, pandemic. Um, you know, I, I think from my perspective, obviously being someone who's you know interested in and who is kind of you know enthusiastic about the, the aviation industry, um, not notwithstanding its particular challenges that it presents in terms of sustainability, but you know, th this industry has been really quite heavily hit alongside tourism um, and, and hospitality. But you know, I think it's pretty well contextualised here in this data from IATA, the International Air Transport Association, which has been publishing quite regular updates since the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic last year. But you can see here that in 2020, you know, the, the airline industry has faced total losses of 118 billion and that demand has been down at 65.9% versus uh, the demand for travel in 2019. Now, you kind of look at what's happening around the world and you think, well, you know, the airline industry to many people, you think, well, well it's, you know, it's, it's a sexy industry. It's, you know, it's, it's one that sort of speaks of glamour and glitz. And, and the reality really is, is very different for the people who work in the industry. It's an industry that struggles and has struggled over decades to, and to really make profit and it goes through these cycles of of profitability and then downturns where it makes uh you know catastrophic losses and and we're in kind of one of those periods at the moment and the reason for that of course is because the airline industry and um, is an industry that that exists in, in because of derived demand it only exists because people need to do something else there are very few people and um, bar a few a few geeks among us who might get up in the morning and think to themselves, oh, I'm, I'm off to the airport today. I'm, I'm going to catch a plane and just just catch a flight. Um, you know, most people travel because they have a need to travel, be it for holiday uh, or be it for for business or because they need to transport goods um, over long distances. So the aviation industry is very subject to those bigger kind of economic challenges that present um, around the world from time to time. Where there's recession, the airline industry tends to suffer. And unfortunately, that's kind of what we're kind of we're in that kind of perfect mix at the moment where we've got this kind of global pandemic, which is hopefully, you know, a, a once in a lifetime event. But, you know, there have been uh, markers, there's been indicators over recent decades that this was a threat that that could really have come upon us at any time. And, you know, it, it has happened. But, you know, the question is, well, you know, how resilient can we be? How well prepared can we be to kind of offset that this threat in the future? But also the issue right now that we're going to be looking at really in this moment is about the issue of recovery and, and how quickly the industry can recover. I've got some quite specific data here from IATA and um, you can see here, you know, that the recovery started actually in 2020. Once, you know, the first wave of the pandemic, certainly in, in Western markets, began to kind of, you know, rec recede. There was some, uh, you know, demand. There was there was a little bit of recovery, particularly in terms of uh, domestic uh, demand, in terms of uh, revenue, in terms of revenue passenger kilometres, RPKs and the, the amount of uh, of travel that was actually undertaken. And, you know, I, I travelled uh, last last summer, um, albeit domestically uh, within the UK. International borders uh, have been closed. They remain closed. Uh, in fact, that, that has probably increased. 
And so there was a little bit of recovery, but then you can see then as we head into the end of the year, that recovery begins to kind of uh, curve off and, and begin to fall again. This uh, particular uh, set of data um, indicates where um, we might in the world reach um, herd immunity uh, in terms of uh, vaccination. And you can see, you know, that um, you know, some of these countries, you know, looking down to Japan, Latin America, India, China, Russia, you can see that we're kind of looking at quite far out projections in some cases into the end of 2022 into uh, 2023. And, and these are projections that depend upon the successful rollout of the vaccination strategy and then borders, countries begin, uh, begin being willing to open up their borders to international travel. So the key message, as it says here at the very top you know, of the slide, you know, reduction in travel restrictions will depend on the efficacy um, you know, of, that, of the vaccination programme against the emerging variants that, uh, you know, that we, we see the, the vaccination kind of programme able to catch up with um, any of those changes that um, appear. We can see that bookings for future travel um, are down significantly. Again, you know, data from IATA. Um, you know, so after improving to you know minus sixty percent year on year by the end of twenty twenty, bookings are now down minus seventy percent because of course we ended up in in another lockdown, not just in the UK, but you know the the the, the pandemic rose again um, in other significant markets around the world. Also, you know, in places like the United States where they've not really begun to kind of get a handle on the, on the uh, pandemic until until now. So, um, of course, in the last week or so, we've we've had this week, you know, from the government in the UK, the, the announcement, you know, that, that we're looking towards a potential easing of lockdown and therefore um, we're, we're look, people are suddenly thinking, oh, can we go on holiday? And they're starting to make plans already, although, you know, the government advice on that is very muted. There's an awful lot of, you know, well, just be careful. No, not yet. Don't don't be doing that just yet. Let's you know stand back. And of course, the travel industry are looking at that and going, no, 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 we need people to make bookings because we need money to come in. You know, our, our businesses are, are on our on their knees. And if we don't get some money coming into the business, then, you know, we will see more business failure. So, you know, the RPK path, you know, the, the recovery, the, the, the demand, the revenue passenger kilometer uh, recovery path depends on new variants and, and overall international policy uh, response. And um, th there is this risk here, you know, that the 2021 revenue passenger kilometer, the, the demand supply measure might only grow 13 percent. So, I mean, we're, we're looking really at very muted recovery this year. And, and actually some of the, the kind of outlooks see a recovery in the industry to 20, 20, 2019 levels, you know, spanning out to 2023. Some of the, the more pessimistic, um, you know, outlooks could, or go forward to 2025-26. So we are essentially really looking at a medium to long term change in the demand and in the availability of air transportation uh, around the world, because this, of course, depends upon borders opening up. And we're seeing, for example, you know, recent news headlines in the Australian border um, is, is to remain closed until 2022. So even if you really wanted to go to Australia near the end of this year, you're, you're really looking until 2022 before you can realistically plan any kind of visit. So domestic, uh, sorry, international tourism, both inbound and outbound from Australia is probably, you know, out of the question. Um, we're probably going to see other countries in a similar position. Um, you know, I say the government here are kind of saying to people, just not now, you know, calm down, don't be booking holidays just yet. There's a little bit of confused messaging around that. But of course, you know, since I put this together in the last week, the, the discourse has now moved on. We're talking now about vaccine passports. You know, will you need to have a vaccine passport to get on an aircraft to enter a country? And already airlines are saying, you know, Qantas in Australia being one. Yeah, you know, you're going to need a vaccine passport to be able to end on your board one of our aircraft. Um, Greece in the last couple of days has said, yeah, you know, we're, we're looking at maybe welcoming back tourists. You know, British tourism for, for Greece is, is a big thing. Brits like to get away to, to the sun. Um, and, you know, Greece is saying, well, you know, we might be able to welcome you in, but you'll, you'll need a vaccine passport and other, you know, there, there's a lot of confusion around it. And I think that this policy picture is going to emerge over the next, um, you know, few weeks and, and probably months. So, Essentially, you know, there's there's an awful lot of kind of unknowns at the moment. 
Um, IATA also conducts um, a passenger survey uh, every year. And um, in their kind of most recent survey, um, they did indicate that close to 50% of passengers surveyed uh, were willing to fly within two months of the pandemic subsiding. So only 50% of, dem of passengers who previously would have travelled or are prepared to kind of fly within two months of it. Just think about that for a moment. It means that there's still quite a lot of hesitancy out there amongst the travelling public, amongst uh, the leisure travel. And also, well, what does it mean for, for business travel? Um, you know, businesses have adapted uh, really well, actually, to, you know, where, where they're still active to, you know, doing without travel, communicating using technology such as we are doing this morning. Um, you know, and, and how many of those businesses are going to be willing to go back to what they did before? Because the truth is, if you don't need to travel to a business meeting, well, the savings that are there are, are really quite substantial to a business. The last time we saw a change like this was back in uh, 2000 and uh, so 9-11 back in 2001 after the, the terrorist attacks in, in New York, where there was a significant change in the nature of demand for business travel after that event. It took a long time to recover and arguably never recovered uh, in quite the same way. There were changes in terms of the type of um, products that uh, business travellers were asking for. And, and I do sense we're going to see something like that again. We're going to see a significant change in the nature of business travel, the levels of demand for business travel, and the type of products that the, the, the business passenger is going to, to look for and be prepared to pay for. So, an interesting point here, this 86% of passengers surveyed who had flown last year felt safe. Now that's interesting. So bear in mind that last year there was a significant drop in demand. So the numbers of passengers who travelled last year were really significantly reduced on the previous year. Now I was one of those passengers who flew last year and I would say that yes, it was different. It felt a little bit strange. Uh, did I feel safe? Yes, mostly. But it's interesting here that, you know, 86% of passengers who flew last year, yes, that's significant, but there are a number of passengers who did not feel safe being in an enclosed environment on an aircraft. 50 to 60% of passengers surveyed are prepared to engage with additional safety measures while flying. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, and only 50 to 60%. That still leaves 40 to 50% of passengers who are not really prepared to engage with additional uh, safety measures. They, they're not prepared to uh, put up with the additional inconvenience. And, you know, we see this in terms of society in general. There is a, a residual resistance among particular groups to uh, measures such as mask wearing, even social distancing um, and, of course, the vaccine programme as well. 80 to 90% of survey passengers believe testing should be required. Um, and that's interesting. I mean, um, what we're seeing at the moment, of course, is that most um, jurisdictions are requiring some form of testing either prior to travel or on arrival. And again, I experienced, you know, the, the, the testing uh, traveling down to, for example, the Channel Islands, which are British islands, but they are, are they, they manage themselves independently of the United Kingdom. Um, those islands have, have a testing uh, policy on the border and also a quarantine policy um, on arrival for passengers arriving from certain destinations. Um, so there is certainly a belief that the testing should be required. That may, however, be superseded by, um, you know, the vaccine being required. And as I've said, that discourse has moved on in the last week. We're already seeing that discourse around, well, you know, vaccine passports um, are the way forward. That seems to be the way that's heading. So as I've said, really the outlook generally for aviation is uncertain. Um, you know, I, I hope to find some positivity, but I'm struggling. But, um, you know, there, there is a future here. There absolutely is a case of what does that future look like? The charting a realistic path out of this for the industry at the moment is, is almost impossible. I think it is very much going to be a stop start. Um, and it's not going, the world is not going to open up to travel um, on an equal basis. I expect that we will see a recovery in domestic markets long before we see recovery in international markets. So recovery is likely to be prolonged and erratic with significant regional and sectoral variation. 
And therefore, these inevitable changes that are going to happen to the wider economic context and changing consumer expectations are likely to have even more pronounced and lasting impact. As I've said, one of the things I would look for is a significant shift in the nature of demand for business travel and the kinds of products that business travellers will be looking for, particularly, I would say, over shorter haul distances. Um, We'll maybe see other changes too in terms of long haul demand, in terms of uh, less willingness or less demand for long haul business travel overall. So particular challenges that are going to face is contextually um, around not just the pandemic, but the longer term future resulting from uh, the pandemic. And um, we are already obviously facing recession. And um, this was a threat that had been existing pre-COVID. There was a conversation going around in global markets that, that recession was coming again. And actually, you know, we're, we're 10 to 12 years out from the last global crash. So we're kind of due another recession um, in some respects. And there were indicators in various markets around the world that was on its way. What COVID has done is exacerbate and speed up that process towards recession. There is an expectation that the recovery will be prolonged. However, in terms of certainly the UK, you know, we're seeing that our market has gone through the biggest contraction in probably about 300 years. So the, the, the rebound back will be probably quite rapid once the economy opens up again. But obviously the damage that has been done to the underlying structures of our economy are extreme. And we're going to be dealing with that for a very long time. In terms of what government intends to do about those underlying structural problems that have resulted um, remains to be seen. You know, one of the things we're currently seeing, and again, this was kind of beginning to emerge before the, the pandemic, was the, the threat of negative interest rates, where effectively customers pay the bank to, to look after uh, their money. The the kind of growing, the growing, you know, challenges around sustainability, and I've defined it here particularly as ecology to um, to prevent confusion with the idea of sustainable financial uh, performance or, or, or conversations of that nature. But I think here particularly of environmental ecological uh, problems. Now, quite clearly, aviation um, is 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 absolutely um, a polluter. Um, people travel arguably for leisure. You know, the, the argument is, do you really have to? Um, you know, the, the, the much has been done to kind of reduce emissions from aircraft, to deal with uh, carbon outputs, to look at more sort of sustainable behaviours around airports, etc. But there's still a long way to go. And I would say there's certainly an element of kind of denial or an unwillingness to kind of confront the reality of that particular challenge in certain parts of the industry and in certain um, uh, jurisdictions around the world. However, what we did see before the pandemic was growing consumer awareness and there was certainly uh, an indication that, that customers previously who were of the mind of, well, it's not really my problem, were beginning to indicate actually, yeah, OK, we need to do something uh, about this. And it's not just about emissions from aircraft and noise, it's about the amount of waste that the industry generates. The, the number of bags of plastic and aluminium and other waste that is ejected from an aircraft after a flight would surprise many people who don't have an awareness of, of that, who haven't seen it. And it's quite shocking the amount of waste that is generated from air transportation. So consumer awareness of this is changing and I expect we will see more global demands uh, for change um, on that front. And an interesting one, I think, finally here, that we're seeing a shift in terms of uh, movement of population. And the projection from the United Nations back in 2018 was that 60% of the world population currently lives in cities, but that by 2050, it would be around 68% that would be projected. Now, that may change. That may change because of the global pandemic, potentially. People may sort of want to move out of cities, to create social space and um, etc but at the moment we are looking at this certainly a, a kind of critical tipping point where more than 50 percent of the world's population live in large urban centers that presents challenges for um kind of the, the development of sustainable uh, transportation more generally but it also begins to kind of make us question well the, the nature of the demand transportation particularly over short haul markets now let me be, um, we are a long way off and my colleague Derek, uh, professor, uh, professor uh, Dr Derek Taylor is going to talk in a moment about aerospace, 
but we are a long way off having a solution to long haul flying in a, a kind of safe or sorry a sustainable environmentally friendly way engine technology that will enable that is a long way off but in in short haul uh, travel we are working towards much more sustainable solutions and the 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 kind of the growth in urban living and concentration around cities prevents um, challenges for urban planning but also in terms of what customer consumers want in terms of um travel ex uh, travel demand uh, in a much more sustainable environmentally friendly way and just to kind of illustrate a couple of those and this this is really quite recent and um, we've been talking for quite some time about you know these uh, flying electric taxis and we're seeing um you know the first and made from an airline, uh, United Airlines in the United States has said that they're going to purchase, um, you know, a, a fleet of these small flying electric taxis to begin to kind of bring passengers into aircraft from urban cities. And on the left hand side, actually really exciting that Coventry um, itself is to host uh, the world's first airport for electric aircraft. Now, this is something the university um, is, is involved in as well. But what this presents to is, is where we're kind of heading in terms of the, the, the changing discourse around, around these things. So in terms of careers, just to kind of wrap up for those of you thinking, well, where does this leave us? We've been seeing in the last few years where um, our graduates are heading off into careers that are much more focused around analytics, where airline, businesses are really looking at um, understanding the customer, understanding the behaviour of the customer and collecting more data about them. We're also seeing an uh, increase in demand for uh, data analytics in relation to uh, revenue and finance, where understanding the performance of a route, understanding its profitability. This is where we're seeing jobs still emerge in, in the industry. We have seen a growing focus on customer relationship marking that links into uh, the previous point there about data analytics and customer behavior. But also we need to think much more about route development, you know, where are new markets going to be and in terms of how will those markets be served? Clearly there will be a need to kind of look at scheduling and there will obviously be careers in that, but also product design and development. As I mentioned, that changing demand of the nature of business travel, what will those new products look like? But also so we're seeing a discourse emerging around creating products that will enable more effective social distancing um, on aircraft. Will that be something that we'll need to carry forward into the future? But picking up on some of the things I've been talking around, you know, the issue of sustainability and the idea of public relations and how um, air transport businesses communicate their sustainability to customers. But finally, that point there about cybersecurity and resilience, and not just sorry, cybersecurity, maybe biosecurity as well. The industry needs to really understand this much more, and we're seeing again uh, an emerging discourse around the protection of data and the threats to national infrastructure. And of course, aviation fits into that. And so there are going to be uh, careers um, in these areas for, for in the forthcoming years. What we are going to probably see is a reduction in careers around the actual customer facing uh, role. We're going to see much more technology uh, being put into the industry to actually facilitate the management of the customer experience and the customer journey journey through the airport and on on the right hand side there are just some general kind of areas uh, where you know all businesses are going to be thinking about these themes in terms of project management IT disruptive technologies new business models and change management these are all themes that are current in business and that will be for the foreseeable future and they're as relevant to aviation and air transport management as they are to any other uh, business sector and, and this is where kind of we've really been focusing over the last few years and kind of evolving and transforming our courses to make them much, much more responsive to these uh, these areas for our graduates going forward. So that brings me to the end of my particular contribution in terms of aviation air transport. I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Derek Taylor, who's going to talk to you um, about uh, the, the technology and the aerospace, the engineering aspects. Hi, good morning everyone and oh, good afternoon depending on where in the world you are and it's uh, yeah, great to see um, 
It's a uh, good morning, Ori. Great, great to sort of see everyone uh, here, and uh, thanks for uh, having me along for to give you a bit of a talk about the challenges for the uh, the aviation industry or the aerospace industry going forward. Um, so the topic today, really, uh, for the next twenty or so minutes, is about engineering the future of aviation. We've heard quite a lot there about the changing nature of the markets. Well, what does that mean? for the people who develop the technology behind it. What is the sort of future directions we're looking at? Now, in terms of just a little bit of background of who I am, um, as introduced earlier, I'm an assistant professor here at Coventry in the field of thermodynamics. I'm also the course director for aerospace systems engineering at, um, at Coventry. But prior to, to joining the university, which is about two and a half to three years ago now, I was working in industry, not so much in the aerospace industry. I was actually working in the power generation industry. I worked for Elstom and General Electric, uh, more on steam turbines. However, my background prior to that was more in aerospace. Um, took my PhD at Cambridge at the Woodland Laboratory, focusing on components within a jet engine, aerodynamic performance of that. And I've worked for Rolls Royce previously as well. So I have a, a sort of a fairly good um, idea on the technologies behind the aerospace industry, particularly the propulsion side of things, which you'll see features fairly heavily here. So we've heard a little bit about the challenges to the industry. What does that mean in terms of the technology challenges? Well, I'm going to focus this down onto three particular areas. Okay. One we're going to look at is about sustainability. We've heard a little bit about sustainability already so far in terms of environmental sustainability. We'll, we will touch a bit on that as well, um, but also going to look at things with economic sustainability for businesses. Probably the one that a lot of people want to know about is green propulsion. You know, the challenges around that going forward. And perhaps one that's a bit underrated, but I think within the industry is most uh, seen as one of the biggest challenges going forward is that of systems integration. So we'll go through these. We'll start with the topic then of sustainability. Now, we often hear the word sustainability. The first thing that comes to mind is environmental sustainability, going green effectively. Can we sustain uh, our consumption levels in a way that uh, the planet can handle? But the actual topic of sustainability goes far beyond just that simple definition. And it's really sort of a three pronged approach. We do have the environmental um, concerns about uh, sustainability. But there's also an economic uh, sustainability. It's a business model sustainable in the long term. Right? Um, and then there's also the impact of society um, in terms of sustainability. Um, a business doesn't operate in isolation. It has a workforce that uses the local community and it needs to give back. It cannot be a one way transformation. Um, what I'm going to focus on in this first little section is just about the economic sustainability for some of the businesses and how that's been impacted uh, due to COVID and what the changes are that that's going to um, see for the industry. And then, of course, when we go on to things like green propulsion, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the environment and you can start to see the link between the two. Now, we've heard a lot there about the impact of COVID in particular on uh, the airline industry and what it means for travel. But of course, the impact goes far beyond just that of the airlines, of those who are actually doing the flying. It's the aerospace industry as well that's been bearing quite a large brunt of this. And it's not just the top level manufacturers either. It's not people like Boeing and Airbus. It's everybody in the supply chain. Now, supply chains um, for aerospace, you can often break them down into roughly four tiers. The first tier is your air, your airframe manufacturers, people like Airbus and Boeing. Your second tier is um, the subsystem or component delivery um, of this. So, for example, here, this is a graphic from Boeing that shows where all of their um, parts and components and subsections of the aircraft come from. And you can see it is a global business. They have roughly 50 suppliers, 28 of which are outside the US. Yeah. So if you can see they take uh, some things like the rudder from China, the wingtips from Korea, trailing edges from Japan, uh, central fuselage from Italy, um, the cargo doors from Sweden, uh, landing uh, landing gear doors from Canada, the landing gear itself from the UK. Um, there is a huge reliance on 
gaining parts and components from around the world. And that is just the tier one supplies. Within those, you start to get what are called the tier. So those that, yeah. So the tier two supplies. Within those, you also start to get the tier three. These are what those are the printed to part supplies. They're the ones who make the components that go into these sub assemblies. Sub -assemblies. Um, and obviously, as you go down the tiers, these start to get smaller. Tier four is um, raw materials. So as you start to get down, you get smaller and smaller. Now, here's where the problem is coming in. The, the impact is sort of top down. We're seeing a drop in the passenger numbers, which means that the tier one supplies, the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers are seeing big drops in order. Airbus, for example, delivered 566 jets in 2020, down from 863 the year before. Boeing, even worse, they dropped down to 157, down from 380 in 2019 and down from 806 in 2018. They were, of course, hit by the 737 MAX issue as well. So that they had a double impact of that and COVID to, to deal with. And Boeing in particular saw sort of not only in December this year, saw about last year, saw 90 new jets ordered, but they saw 110 cancelled orders. So there's a big drop in demand for new airliners. Uh, Boeing in particular talking about cutting their air for their workforce by about 20 percent. And as the drop in demand comes in from the higher tiers, um, obviously that feeds down to the lower tiers. The small, the bigger businesses are probably able to cope. Yes, they're going to shed a bit of their workforce, but they will survive. The problem comes in the smaller tier suppliers. If your business is built around supplying Boeing a certain component and they don't demand it anymore, your business becomes unsustainable and unviable. So what are we going to be seeing in terms of this? Well, one of the big changes we're seeing is a bit of consolidation. And that means relying less on this distributed network of many, many suppliers, but bringing them into a smaller manageable number. That doesn't mean bring them all in house. In fact, a lot of the tier one, the manufacturers like Boeing and Airbus are actually shedding some of their in-house uh, facilities to go down to tier one suppliers um, because they want to streamline their business on the bit that makes the money. And that means some of the tier one uh, areas will grow and be a bit better. It's the tier three suppliers where some of them are going to struggle and we're going to have to consolidate them into larger businesses. On the plus side, you might find that some of these tier three suppliers start to diversify. They're no longer going to be focused on just um, uh, servicing the airline industry. Um, the avionics business can start to go into things like autonomous vehicles, anything else that requires electronics, they're going to have to diversify. And for the workforce, that's great because your technical skills now are going to be spread across a much wider range of technology and engineers are going to be much more in demand who can focus on more than just one thing. So we're going to see a substantial shift in terms of sustainabilities of businesses and particularly in terms of supply chains. It's an often underlooked part of, of engineering, but something that we really do need to take a bit of a, a bit of account of. We don't just design the parts, we need to source them and manufacture them. Um, engineering captures that entire gamut of the business. Now, as part of that, the other aspect of sustainability we've talked a bit about is yeah, green propulsion. And <clears throat> airliners pre-COVID were already under severe increasing pressure to do a lot more about emissions. So this push towards green propulsion is not something that is new. However, there have been a number of calls um, around the industry to say that if governments around the world are going to start giving financial relief packages and supporting airline businesses, they must include in that green clauses. Now, whether that actually comes to pass or not remains to be seen, but you can see that COVID is now pushing extra emphasis on this push towards um, greener technology. In addition to that, if we do see a shift towards things like urban transportation, like the, um, the electric taxi um, type um, projects that we just saw, but, but even regional transportation, there's going to be even more of a focus on um, emissions regulations. If you're flitting between small urban centers or even just regional areas within, say, Europe, for example, you're going to be spending a lot more time in takeoff um, uh, part, part, of, part of a flight compared to cruise and that increases things like emissions. So the more regional we get, the more urban centric our transport um, network gets, the greater the focus on the need for green propulsion. So the question we want to ask is, is this the next revolution? And before I go on to what are 
what do we think the technology will look like going forward, it's worth taking a few minutes just to look at the history of the development and the evolution and revolution of propulsion. Because by seeing where we come from, we might get an idea as to where we're going. So let's call the sort of evolution and revolution. We all know, oops, sorry. Uh, we know that in the first sort of flight aircraft was in about 1903, Kitty Hawk. And this was powered by a sort of 12, 12 horse by nine kilowatt engine. This plane could reach about just under seven miles an hour. Right. Now, you might think this is a revolution. This was probably a revolution in terms of this is the first heavier than air powered aircraft, but actually the propulsion system was just an evolution. But it, it's, it's probably the first revolution we've seen in airspace. And within about 15 or 14 years or so, um, we'd seen this continual development. We'd gone to the things like the Sopwith Camel that you could see in, um, during World War One. Again, propeller driven, but now sudden increase up from 12 horsepower to 90 uh, to 130 horsepower can reach 113 miles per hour. And we continued this evolution through it. Um, still the same thing, propeller driven aircraft driven by piston engines to the beginning of World War, World War II, the things like the Supermarine Spitfire. This has gone up from 130 horsepower for the Sopwith Camel to 1400 horsepower, 1400, could reach 370 miles per hour. But you know what they say, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And it was in this time that we saw the first real revolution in aircraft propulsion. And that was the move from propeller power with piston driven engines to the jet engine. What we've got here is the Gloucester Whittle uh, E2829. Um, now we stop measuring engines in terms of horsepower because the piston engine, we stop measuring them in terms of thrust. And this could, this engine could deliver some just under eight kilonewtons of thrust and could reach speeds um, nearly 450 miles per hour. And this is the real revolution gone from, gone as the propeller does piston engines, in comes the jet engine. And it didn't take us long to go from 1941 to 1953 where we started commercializing that, take it out of the military and put it into commercial aircraft with the de Havilland Comet. Um, and again, what we saw, bigger aircraft need for bigger thrust. This is probably three to four times the thrust per engine the, than the original jet engine that we saw. And ever since then, this design has been evolving and it's been evolving to give us more and more efficient engines. Okay, uh, One way of doing that was to go from a pure turbojet to a bypass engine, which took us all of about five years. Um, and the aim for this was to improve propulsive efficiency, reduce fuel burn, be able to do these longer and longer journeys. The Boeing 707 was the first one to introduce a bypass engine, a low bypass, had a ratio of about one to one. Following on from that, and engines have just continually been growing bigger and bigger. This is the Boeing 747. I think this has the, um, uh, it's had a range of engines from Pratt & Whitney G or Rolls-Royce, but they are, bigger, the bypass ratio is about five to one. By bypass ratio, we talk about the amount of air that passes around the engine, goes through a big fan, passes around the engine, compared to what goes through the middle. What goes through the middle was the original technology Whittle developed um, for the jet engine. And by putting more and more air around the engine through a big fan, we get better and better efficiencies. And engines have continued to grow. So we now have engines with bypass ratios of close to 10 to one. This is one of the latest ones. It's a Trent XWB for the A350. So what we can see is the aircraft technology development has been going in such a way to increase efficiencies, but fundamentally the technology has remained the same. So the question really is, what next? If we look at some of the options that are out there, we can continue to evolve. The problem with getting by bigger and bigger bypass engines, the engines get bigger and bigger and bigger. So one option is to go to what we call open rotors. It looks like a return to propeller aircraft, and fundamentally it is. They can now use two rows of rotors, and this one has put the rotors at the back of the engine. But fundamentally, the propulsion system inside has remained the same. Better efficiency, still burning fossil fuels. Alternative to that is, that, well, there's two sorts of alternatives that this could go down the route of. One is finding a new fuel. And one option for that is hydrogen. Most fuels that we currently burn are hydrocarbon based. What happens when you burn them, the carbon inside them oxidizes to form carbon dioxide, and that's what we avoid. The hydrogen in our fuel uh, oxidizes to form water. So if we have a fuel that is pure hydrogen, the only product is water. So we'll see on the next slide, however, there are some problems with this. So we could just use hydrogen as an alternative combustion. Alternatively, we can use hydrogen directly in a fuel cell to produce electricity. 
you put hydrogen in, put oxygen in, put them over a catalyst, and what happens is you get an electron flow. We generate electricity. So we could replace this entire central unit here with a fuel cell or a battery, and the actual mode of propulsion is going to stay the same. It's just the fuel source that's different. And of course, the alternative to using something like hydrogen is just directly to use battery technology. In the short term, however, before we get to using any of these, we're likely to use some sort of hybrid system of these. Now, initial attempts have been going on for this. I think uh, attempts at full source electric aircraft started in about the 1970s, um, but never really successfully. <coughs> now, they tend to be limited to very small aircraft. This is a Boeing uh, example. This uses a hydrogen fuel cell to power it. You can see this takes us very much back to the early days of aviation. We're going to these small aircraft to get our propulsion systems working. And other options are being developed. This uses a traditional propeller design. Um, GE uh, developing a design uh, called the Catalyst Engine, which is a hybrid power system. You can see it just uses effectively a ducted fan. Gone is the core of an engine. We're just left with the fan side of things. And there are still other options there, but we're still a long way off. Airbus and Rolls-Royce have put together a joint project. They were looking at this type of hybrid propulsion and they were actually intending to have a demonstrator fly in 2021. And unfortunately this year in April, or last year in April, um, they canned the project. Um, and part of the reason may well have been things to do with COVID. You know, shedding off unnecessary parts of the business that are not gonna make money. They need the business to be sustainable. And one of the big hits of this is R&D. Uh, which is a shame because, of course, the other aspect of this is we need this, this next revolution. So what are some of the challenges with hydrogen and electricity? Well, the first is weight, particularly when it comes to electronics, not just the batteries, but the rest of the power electronics are surprisingly heavy and you have to carry this around. Not only that, when it comes to fuels, normally on an aircraft, you start off heavily laden, but by the time you come to land, you've burnt off all your fuel. You've lost significant weight. You don't get that with electric technologies. The other issue is to do with energy density. So I've got here um, a chart that shows what we call volumetric energy density, which is energy per litre of fuel or litre occupied of uh, metre cube, effectively, yes, space volume occupied. And on this axis, on the x-axis, we've got the gravimetric energy density, the amount of energy per release per kilogram of fuel or material. And right at the top here, we've got our liquid fuels, our diesels, our jet engines. And you can see they're very, very high on the volumetric energy density, which means they're very compact and they're very light for the amount of fuel that they release, uh, the amount of energy they release. Now let's look at some of the alternatives. Hydrogen sits down here. Per kilogram of hydrogen, it actually releases a lot of energy, but hydrogen being a gas means it occupies a large space. So either you need to have very, very big fuel tanks or you need to compress it to very, very high pressures so it becomes a liquid uh, for storage, which then in turn brings its own safety concerns. Batteries are sort of the, uh, it's a bit in the middle of this. Um, we're starting, we started lead acid batteries are down here. We're now start, starting to improve things, but you can still see um, per volume, per size, they don't generate quite as much power as an equivalent volume of fuel, um, but they are very, very heavy and you've got to lug this weight around with you. We're waiting for this development to continue up and it will get there. It's just going to take time. The other challenges of this are to do with infrastructure. Um, how do you charge your batteries? Where do you get your source of hydrogen from? At the moment, that comes from industrial uh, byproducts, not very sustainable. You can make that through electrolysis of water, it becomes a bit more sustainable. Um, but infrastructure goes beyond just the aircraft infrastructure. What about the airports? If airplanes are getting heavier because they're having to lug around batteries, for example, um, that don't shed their weight as you lose and you come into land, you're going to need either an aircraft with higher lift or you're going to need a longer runway, something perhaps you don't want for regional transport where space is a premium. But what we're seeing from this is that we're starting with short range aircraft. In fact, we're starting more with urban transportation. Things like UAVs and drones are going to lead the way. But as you saw from the history of aircraft, we started small and then we scale up. And I think we're going to start to see exactly the same thing happening here. 
I was going to finish off here with the final little challenge that uh, I mentioned for, for the aerospace industry, and probably one of the biggest ones. Um, as part of our continual development process within our courses, we have what is known as um, industrial advisory boards, which is the industry come in and advise us on the latest challenges to make sure our courses are up to date. And during one of the recent ones with um, for the aerospace courses, we had somebody from uh, BAE Systems come in and we asked them, what is the biggest challenge facing the aerospace industry going forward? And his answer was this, systems integration. And systems integration is about ensuring all the aircraft systems operate both individually and together. So if you take an example, here's a, a, a schematic of a fuel system for a Boeing 747. Its job is to take fuel from the tanks provided to the engines. And to do that, it goes through a series of pumps and filters, um, and it has a lot of interconnectivity so that we can balance fuel weights, uh, for example. We also have to have on that system the ability to refuel, to dump fuel if we ever need to. So that system is one on its own. It needs to do a particular job, it needs to be specced to do that and tested to, to ensure it can do it. That's one system. What we're now looking at is systems of systems. The aircraft is made up of numerous systems from the fuel system to the power systems for the um, for the thrust, uh, landing gear systems, actuation, making sure all the control surfaces work, uh, power systems for the rest of the aircraft, thermal management. It's not just about making the aircraft fly, it's about making sure the people inside are comfortable and don't freeze. The entertainment systems, all the avionics systems, uh, aircraft uh, sort of crash avoidance systems, autopilots, all of these are individual systems, but they need to work together and this is where the biggest challenge now comes. The number of systems on an aircraft are just continuously growing and getting them to all work together and making sure who retains ownership of the overall system of systems so you can check them from a safety point of view is one of the biggest challenges going forward. And as we progress further, this challenge gets even harder because we're not only worried about how a single aircraft works, we're now starting to worry about swarms of aircraft, yeah, drones, to start with, things like the RAF are actively investigating what we call drone swarms. And even on a simple UAV, you've got all of these individual systems. You have them all talking to each other to operate one aircraft. And now you've got to get all these things working together um, so that in a safe manner that all achieves the, the, the ideal outcomes. And if we extend this, we can start thinking things like we saw earlier about the electric taxi airport. And what we're eventually going to see if we get a, a big increase in urban transportation is more autonomous type designs. Do we have autonomous aircraft? Do we have automated um, air traffic control centers? Having these connections between um, different aircraft is probably the biggest challenge we're going to see going forward. So I'll finish off there by saying that, yes, the aerospace industry is going to be different going forward. And yes, there's a lot of uh, thoughts about there about our job losses, etc. But the simple fact is the technology challenges are going to remain. And they're, in fact, I think of the next coming couple of decades, we're probably going to see some of the most uh, interesting times to be in the aviation industry. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Derek, and thank you so much, Ivan, for today's session. Uh, it has been really insightful, and thanks for your presentations. Uh, we have here a few questions from our students uh, attending, um, and we're going to start with uh, one for Ivan. Um, so there's a student asking, um, says, hello from Hong Kong. Do you think that the recovery of the aviation industry for COVID-19 will be similar to the previous pandemics, such as the SARS outbreak? Um well, the, the, the particular difference there, thanks for the question, the big difference is that the previous pandemics weren't proper pandemics. Um, they were epidemics that were really quite successfully regionally confined. Um, what I would say actually is that I wish maybe that the world and the industry had maybe taken a bit more on board from how Hong Kong successfully managed the, the SARS outbreak many, many years ago. Um, I think we might be in a slightly different place um, if we kind of maybe paid a bit more attention to that. Um, so I, I think I think this will be different. This is a proper global shock. Um, that's yeah, I think the recovery from this is going to be very different. 
I, I agree. I think you were the SARS was very isolated to the East Asia side of the world, and this has definitely been completely different. Um, so we will learn from. You would think that we learn from from things that happened in the past, but we are now learning as we go, and I think that things will. Oh get better. <laughs> Thank you. There's another student who's asking as, as well for you, Ivan. Um, do you consider starting a, this is greetings from Greece, do you consider that starting a master's in aviation management this year would be a smart career choice despite the global pandemic effects on aviation industry? Wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> Do you know what? I have to say yes. Yes, of course, yes. <laughs> what, what, I, what I would say, and I mean, this is just to give you a little bit of contextualised uh, data, uh, rather just to help me be informed. I would this year we were expecting actually our our intake of students to actually decline. We were preparing for that for September. We were expecting numbers to drop. In fact, we've had the largest intake of students to both of our, un our undergraduate program and one of the largest intakes to our postgraduate program that we've had in quite some time. So um, I think that's a vote of confidence. Uh, I also think going back to my presentation that it's actually a marker of, of the fact that what I genuinely perceive actually is, is going to be a demand for more graduate type careers in the industry. I think I said that what we're probably going to see is a decline in demand for more um, customer facing operational type roles. We're going to need people with graduate type skills. In fact, we're currently just taking through an approval program process for a new a new course, a new dimension in our postgraduate program, specifically looking at the themes of leading innovation and change in the industry uh, as an outflow of, of the pandemic. So yes, I think you should absolutely apply for a master's in transport management at the moment. <laughs> you know, and it's something that we I also for not just a master's but students thinking of doing an undergraduate course. Like the undergraduate course will take you three years, and by the time that you finish your degree, you will hopefully be out of it. So this yeah. is an opportunity for students to maybe like perhaps dive deeper, and if it's a master's, uh, specialising something that will be needed in the future for sure. Thank you for that. Can I just say one last little quick thing, actually, just to caveat a little bit. The, the master's degree in air transport management or aviation, it's a master's degree in a management discipline. And so the, the skills that you learn are portable into other areas. It doesn't define you and it doesn't can, it doesn't stick you into that aviation air transport box. The graduates with those kinds of degrees who move into other areas too. Thank you, Alan. That's very, very important to point out. Um, and Derek, we have a student here asking a question for you. Uh, it says, greetings from the UAE. Um, how would COVID-19 affect the space industry? Like, how has it affected the space industry? I think the students are trying to ask. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, obviously, I mean, we, we talk a lot about the aerospace industry and what we focused on uh, so far in this talk has been more sort of the uh, the airline industry and the sort of the, um, sort of, uh, the earth based uh, type, type systems. But uh, our courses in that do look indeed at beyond that is the, the aerospace industry. Now, fortunately, space travel and um, things is, is still very much in its infancy in terms of um, actually getting people out there. We've had NASA and that around for, for years to go and do a space exploration, but in terms of making it more accessible to the general population, it's in its, it's, in its infancy. So I would hope from that respect that COVID-19 won't have too much of an impact on it because we're looking longer term. Where it may have a bit of an impact on is uh, shorter term is, is things like budgets uh, and that if, if people don't have uh, the money to spend on it and have to streamline, streamline their business. Where I see the biggest uh, impact on this is actually we're starting to put forward some of these new technologies, perhaps not so much on the propulsion side of things, but the rest of the, uh, the system, the systems involved in that are being developed for, air, uh, for space travel, as well as things like material development are going to start to feed back into our traditional aviation industry um, and you get the sort of downwards uh, thing, uh, transfer technology a bit like formula one technology transferring with occurs and battery technology into uh, into vehicles it's this technology transfer that's going to really affect us um, you saw recently the, the spacex launch and if you ever if you watch that live and watch people sitting inside those uh, the shuttles going up and looked at the brand shiny new equipment you realize compared to the old um uh, shuttles and that went up the technology uh, that has gone into this has just seen leaps and bound improved in leaps and bounds and we can only see that as a good thing it's going to just start in one area and just transform the entire the entire industry um, so yes, I'm hoping that COVID won't affect that too much because that is one of the biggest sources 
of technology transformation we're going to see going forward. Thank you, Derry. That's very insightful. Um, and just one last question for a student, and I think this may be for either of you, because this is, I think, quite related to engineering and also for like the aviation industry. Do you think the demand for pilots will decrease because of the development of artificial intelligence? <laughs> These questions are good. These kids are like, yeah, on it. <laughs> can, can I take that one first? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I, I think, and, and I have to tell you, there are a lot of my colleagues and a lot of industry professionals out there I know who might get you know, to hear me say that <laughs> and, and I'll be shot down in flames. Um, but I think based actually on what Derek has just said, actually, uh, I think it's inevitable. It absolutely is. And I certainly have colleagues um, who, who elsewhere who are kind of doing research into this actually to do with the acceptability to a passenger of an unmanned flight deck or an, un, an unpiloted flight deck. Um, the technology already exists. It's there. It's quite simply down to passenger customer acceptability and, and regulation. Yeah, uh, if, if I can, I can just sort of uh, just add to that. Um, I think what we can start to see is the shift. Um, you can probably start to see the trends already in things like the automotive industry, where we are now starting to develop autonomous vehicles. But look at some of the challenges that that's showing. It'll give you an idea on some of the time scan time spans we're thinking of. You see in the news anything about a, a crash involving an autonomous vehicle? It's headline news. People drive cars and crash them every day. That's not news. A computer drives it and crashes it. Big news. And there is this big issue there about, yeah, as I said, acceptability as to what are we as humans willing to accept? And if a computer causes a crash and causes a death, who's to blame? Uh, and there are big issues about that, but we can see there is this march towards it, but it is going to take a while for this to become the norm. Um, and that is going to, it's not something that's going to happen instantaneously. I mean, you could see how long it's taking to get through for the for the uh, road bay or sort of or, um, automotive industry. Um, and that's when you're dealing with uh, land-based things and you haven't got to worry about altitude changes. Fortunately, aircraft are a lot more further spaced apart, but the challenges and risks are significantly higher when you're carrying a lot more people. What happens when things go wrong? Um, Future-proofing it. I'm sure that people will be. There will be a bit, perhaps, a resistance at the beginning. But I, I totally agree with Ivan and, and, and you that this is the future, and that perhaps artificial intelligence and um, self-driven planes will will be the future for for the industry. But I just want to say thank you both again for joining us, and thank you to all the students around the world who who are listening. Uh, and we're hoping that you enjoy the session. This will be available on YouTube on our uh, Coventry University channels. Uh, and thanks again, Dr. Derek and I mean, Professor Ivan. I'm really happy to have you here. And well, hopefully see you next time.